Chairwoman is um, under the weather this morning, so you get, you're stuck with me as your uh, chair of the of the committee this morning. So I will introduce myself, Heather Hall, Vice Chair of the Finance Committee and First District Councilwoman, and my in uh, chamber colleagues will introduce themselves, and then we'll go online. That's I'm Kevin O'Neill, First District at Large. Andrea Booth, Sixth District at Large. All right, and my colleagues online. Councilman I see Barnes. Go ahead, everybody. Dan Fowler, second district. Good morning, Lee Barnes, fifth district at large. Good morning. Brandon Ellenson, third district at large. Good morning. All right, and will our staff introduce themselves, Howard? Oh, Rice City Clerk's Office. Great. All right, and at this time, I will introduce Krista Morrison, our budget officer, who will give us an overview of this morning and what we're doing in our submitted budget. And then at that point, I will also introduce our city manager. So, Hi, here. good morning. <laughs> here, right here. Join us. Uh, I'll sit over here. Oh, come on. I'm not frightening. Good morning. All right, you may introduce yourself. Hello, city manager Brian Platt. Good morning. All right, good morning, Krista, welcome. Well, good morning. Um, good morning, uh, members of City Council, Krista Morrison, Budget Officer. Today is our second of three public budget meetings. Uh, this is an incredibly important part of Kansas City's budget process. Our budget should reflect the values and priorities of Kansas City's residents. So we are here today uh, to receive feedback on Kansas City's submitted budget. So I'm going to start with a brief overview. Kansas City's submitted budget is a $2.04 billion budget. Kansas City's budget is broken in two categories. The first is governmental activities. That is all funds with the exception of business type. That's our water and aviation departments are our business type activities. Governmental activities in the submitted budget is $1.3 billion. That represents a change of $32.6 million from the current budget or a 2.5% increase. Business type activities in the budget represents $730.3 million, representing a $79.6 million or 12.2% increase from the current budget. The majority of that increase in business type activities is related to our new, AV, our new airport and that is debt service for that airport, and that is offset by the increase in use and lease agreements with the airlines. So Kansas City's budget is available at kcmo.gov forward slash budget. Uh, the complete documents there, this is an overview of how Kansas City's budget is structured. It includes a transmittal letter, city overview, budget overview, then we get into more details, starting with program and activity pages. That's where we break out each and every department and major program activities and services provided within those departments. There's a capital and debt overview section of Kansas City's budget, glossary, and fund schedules. The fund schedules slice and dice the Kansas City's budget in almost any view you might want to look at. Um, if you don't want to read all 679 pages of Kansas City's budget, I would um, at, I would say focus on two areas. One is the transmittal letter. That is a letter developed uh, from our city manager, Brian Platt, as well as Mayor Quentin Lucas. It covers major changes to Kansas City's budget, as well as department level changes. And then the budget overview section of Kansas City's budget is very high level, um, talking about changes at, at the fund level, at the department level. So those are two summary sections if you were to look at Kansas City's budget. Kansas City's budget itself is broken out in um, what we call really three categories. It is a large budget at $2.04 billion, um, but that has to cover a lot of important services provided across the city. So we're gonna start with some of the most restrictive of Kansas City's budget, and that's the business type activity funds. Water, sewer, and aviation funds, they're over here in the red section, that represents 36% of Kansas City's budget. Those are user charges, and they can only be used for 
purposes of supporting our water and aviation department. Then we get into our next category, also what we would consider uh, restrictive, is our special revenue funds, capital funds, and debt funds, rep representing 34% of Kansas City's budget. These funds are designated by either what the ballot language or authorizing uh, legislative authority approve them to do so. An example is your park sales tax. Um, that sales tax can only be used in Kansas City's park system to support Kansas City parks. And then our final category here is Kansas City's general fund. This is considered the least restrictive, but it also supports some of our major services across the city. A few of those include our fire department, our police department, housing, solid waste, and recycling services. So we'll jump into Kansas City's general fund. On the right, this represents where the money comes from, our revenue by type. Kansas City's budget, the majority of 44.6% comes from earnings tax. Uh, that is followed by 15% of utility tax, 10.9% of property tax. I won't read through each one, but this is where the money's coming from. The chart on the left represents expenditures by city council goals. So this is where the money goes. In the general fund, 75% of Kansas City's general fund budget uh, supports public safety. That is our police department, fire department, and municipal court. The next category is finance and governance. This is um, our internal support departments across the city, such as our law department, finance department, general services that supports many centralized services, such as fleet across the city, uh, risk management. <clears throat> the next category is housing and healthy communities at 11.8%. This represents our housing department, it represents our neighborhoods department. Also included in this category is uh, our trash and recycling program for this city. And then our, the 1.1% is infrastructure and accessibility. What I wanna highlight here is, you see the total budget of expenditures, uh, $682.6 .6 million, and the revenue for the general fund is $655.5 million. We are anticipating in the submitted budget we will draw down fund balance by $27.2 million. Krista, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Um, on the uh, submitted budget, initially it says uh, business activity funds $730 million. But under the, uh, the general fund, you say the, the total budget is $682 million. So there's a difference there of about $100 um, about 100 million maybe? So the business type activities referenced on page two, that is aviation and water department's budget. So that is different from the amount represented on slide five, which is the general fund only. So that is all of our general fund supported departments, if I understood your question. Well, I mean, I, I think the business type activity funds they include the airport and the... Uh... It is the airport okay. and the water department. So the general fund doesn't include either of those? Correct. Okay. So are we using the business type activity funds? For, for as an example, we have a 25% due the police department. We are using the $730 million on that, or are we using the $682 million on that? Uh, for the calculation of 25% of general revenues, um, the business type activities are excluded from that calculation, um, but it does include some different categories of special revenue funds. The, the, I, I guess the question is, is, is what, what, do we, what number do we utilize for that calculation? Um, I'm happy to supply that detail. It is a complex, we look at every single revenue across the entire city. And it's a determination of is it, uh, is it considered general revenue or not? And we work with our um, law department to define what is general revenue, what is restricted. So it is not an easy answer, 
but I'm happy to supply. We look at each and every revenue source across the city to define what's restricted and not as part of that calculation. The general fund revenue is certainly um, the, the largest portion going into that calculation, 25%, but there are other revenues included in that calculation. So it is above that amount as part of the 25%. Yes, I understand that, but I guess my question is, is we're passing a budget that would it would seem to be to be a number that we would have to have to pass a budget. We certainly have that number. I can pull that up. Um, I would just send it to yes, you. Yes, we, we have that number, um, I, and we can certainly provide that. No, I just want So to answer your question specifically, um, our finance director was very quick working behind me here. Uh, the calculation of general revenues for Kansas City equates to 797, 797.7 million dollars, and that is the basis for the 25 percent. Thank you. Appreciate it. So Kansas City's annual budget is based on a adopted five-year financial plan. Um, this city council uh, passed years ago a requirement to look uh, forward-looking as we consider any annual budget to help inform policy decisions. This is the general fund five-year adopted financial plan. It was updated in 2023. And I think what is important here is you see the expenditures are in blue and revenue is in red. Our expenditures across the city are outpacing the rate of growth for revenue. What this means is we, you are considering a structurally imbalanced budget, um, but moving forward, we are going to need to look at additional revenue opportunities, as well as considering um, offsetting reductions ahead. So these next slides will touch uh, base on highlights included in Kansas City's fiscal year 24 submitted budget, starting with public safety. Uh, the submitted budget funds six million for a detention and rehabilitation center design. It adds 800 or, or 80,000 to expand outdoor tornado warning systems. It adds 300,000 for flood warning system and continues to fund the enhanced snow removal initiative started by city manager Platt, along with purchasing additional equipment for snow removal. And this budget expands the park ranger program. Infrastructure and accessibility highlights here. It adds a million dollars of matching funds for capital grants so we can leverage city dollars with available state and federal dollars for capital funding. It invests 500,000 for wayfinding signs throughout the city. It invests $1 million in Vision Zero. Vision Zero is the city's um, program to look at the most dangerous intersections across the city and address that. It also implements year two of an LED light conversion. Housing and healthy communities, it adds, this budget adds a million dollars for tree planting. That is a planned investment over three years and that uh, will plant 10,000 trees across Kansas City. It creates a team dedicated to short-term rental inspections. It funds an increase of 500,000 in youth employment programs across the city for a total budget of 650,000. And it adds 400,000 to expand the right to legal counsel program. Since the legal counsel program started in June 1st, 2022, um, the last data available in December, over 1,100 individuals and families facing eviction were supported through this program. The submitted budget creates a volunteer coordinator in our neighborhoods department to support um, minor cleanups and minor home repair. It fully funds the first year bulky item expansion. It adds 285,000 in, in addition to other dollars in our health department to support mental health programming. And it continues to fund enhanced street and litter cleaning. 
This submitted budget adds a million dollars for trash carts and 1.4 million to support recycling carts. And it funds $5 million of the remaining American Rescue Plan federal dollars for the Rebuild KC Neighborhoods Program. <clears throat> In the category of finance and governance, this is the first a full year that this city council's approved compensation plan and market pay adjustments um, are captured in the annual budget. What that represents, uh, we were facing a real crisis in a vacancy rate across the city. Here's a statistic for our labor class em employees of what that represents. That represented a 12.6% average increase in salaries for labor class employees and enacting a new minimum wage of $17.36. The submitted budget expands the equity office. And then I'll just touch on this bottom point. It centralizes various services across the city, such as our IT staff, procurement staff, communication staff, and human resources staff to improve oversight, accountability, and efficiency. The submitted budget capital improvements plan continues an increased investment in street preservation. Uh, the city manager um, may, had the initiative to invest $100 million more over five years. This submitted budget is the third year of that increased inv investment, and that was $20 million each of each of those years for the total of $100 million. It also invests $5 million in sidewalks and $2.5 million in ADA um, repairs and improvements. The budget invests over the next five years in sidewalks around schools specifically. And this was from one-time revenue uh, with a capital sales tax coming in higher than anticipated. When we were out in Piat community meetings, we heard loud and clear um, across the city um, the request to invest in around uh, our schools for sidewalk improvements and new sidewalks. So Kansas City's legislative process related to his budget. Kansas City's budget was submitted by the city manager and mayor on February the 9th. We are, um, City Council will be passing on March the 23rd, Kansas City's annual budget with or without amendment. We're in the process right now of public engagement. Um, so we can hear from the public, um, services do you want more of or less of? Um, and then we have one more opportunity after today for public engagement. And uh, that is Tuesday, March 7th, from 6 to 8.30 p.m. The meeting will be um, a similar format today. We will have a virtual option available, as well as you can attend here at, in City Hall, at, at, in, in the chambers here. Free parking will be provided at the Wolf Garage at 11th and Oak for those that wish to attend in person. And then if you want to learn more, again, about Kansas City's budget or these meetings, please do visit kcmo.gov forward slash budget. I will mention for those attending online, we do have a question and answer option available. If you have a specific question about Kansas City's budget, um, we welcome you to put that question in there. There are a team of professionals, budget professionals, um, answering those questions during this meeting. If we can't get you an immediate answer today, we'll get your email address and get back with you. So that is a, that concludes the overview, and I will hand it back to our finance um, co-chair, or uh, co-chair, or our chair for today, Councilwoman Hall, uh, so we can do what we're here for, and that's really to hear from our citizens. Wonderful. Thank you, Krista, for the report this morning. Uh, we have been joined by some of our colleagues, uh, so I'd like to have them introduce themselves, and then we'll get started with public testimony. We'll start with uh, Councilwoman Parkshaw. Good morning. Uh, Fifth District Councilwoman Raina Parkshaw, thank you all for being here today. Good morning. Okay, and I think we have Robinson and Bunch, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Good morning, uh, Councilwoman Melissa Robinson, Third District. Um, Krista, I do have a question. Um, so I don't know if you guys see my hand, but um, can she come back? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Krista, thank you for the presentation and all the hard work that you've done to pull this budget together. Can you uh, provide for us, you talked about the structural imbalance that we have. Can you, um, this is a yes or no question, uh, can you let us know if management has given any direction regarding uh, revenue opportunities 
or reduction opportunities um, to address the structural imbalance? Well, I will, um, I don't know that there's any specific program that has been identified for reduction. Some of the revenue opportunities that I will mention, um, we've got a couple on the ballot ahead. Um, one is the marijuana tax uh, for recreational marijuana. We also have um, on the April 2023 ballot, um, a tax related to and fees related to uh, short-term rentals. Uh, and that's just in response to like the Airbnb. There's, we're seeing a, a dynamic change in years in, in how individuals are visiting Kansas City and where they're staying. Um, outside of that, we are having some conversations in, in areas. I'm going to use um, uh, cable as an example. We've seen a decline in cable revenue over um, recent years. And part of the reason for that is more individuals are streaming uh, services into their home. So that is something we will be talking about with legislative priorities ahead. Uh, working with Jeff City, we can't do all of this independent to ourselves. We do have to work with our uh, partners in Jeff City. Uh, but those are just a few examples. On the expenditure side, um, I will say this city council approved a new approach to how we budget uh, in Kansas City. It's called priority-based budgeting. We will be working over the next year to and year and a half to implement priority-based budgeting. And why that is meaningful is um, Kansas City has historically budgeted in an approach called incremental budgeting. And that is basically plus or minus a percentage every year. And that tends to work well in a stable economic time. When the economy is volatile and uh, you're starting to look at across the board cuts year after year after year, um, it is challenging because then we aren't as necessarily as strategic as we want to be. So what priority-based budgeting does ahead is it actually looks at each and every program across the city, how it connects and helps us meet our goals and objectives. It looks at criteria such as, for each program across the city, what percentage of our population does each of those programs serve? Are there other providers in the community that provide a like service? And if they do, is it affordable and accessible? Those are two important caveats there. Um, those are just a few examples of, of how we're going to approach this ahead so we can be very strategic as a city in if we add and have um, the opportunity to invest, we know what our top program priorities are, and then we are very strategic in understanding and discussing which programs we're going to cut ahead and, and have those very frank conversations about um, the percentage of the population each one serves and how they align to our business plan and our priorities of this city. Right. Okay, so finally, and I, obviously we've talked about this a lot, so this is for the benefit of those who are listening. Um, and it's really, I wanted her to go in detail about priority-based budgeting so people understand um, continually how we're changing this process. So if you could just real briefly, because obviously we're here to hear from the public, but um, share with the public what's the um, timelines that we're meeting over the next 18 months to implement priority-based budgeting, and how will they be given voice during this process and agency over how we choose those priorities? And that's all that I have. Um, if you could, it's, I think it's important for us to this during the time while we have the public attention. Yes, and thank you for those questions. Um, very much appreciate it. So with our, our new city council coming in, so Kansas City Citywide Business Plan is passed, and, and it's a four-year plan. We look at it every year to see if there are any items, um, how are we doing in accomplishing those items in it, as well as um, are there additional items we need to add to that. With the new city council coming in um, next summer, Kansas City will be uh, preparing a new citywide business plan. And there will be resident engagement sessions where we're out um, and we want as much input and cross-section of the population because um, it is. we really need the input to say, what are the values? 
What are we doing well? What is your broad vision for Kansas City? So that process will be happening over the summer. And then we will be leading into with our new city council coming in with that input. Uh, this is what we heard from the citizens. Let's discuss what the goals of this city council is with that input from the public. What are those objectives? And then our department directors work with the city manager to define strategies and key performance indicators of how we're going to meet those objectives and, uh, um, over the next four years or the term of city council. Uh, so that, I think, is key for the public to attend those meetings, um, to really tell us what is your vision for Kansas City, what should we be focusing on. Um, it, priority based budgeting and really changing how we, um, re, how we approach our budget is going to take time. So once we have the new city council's goals and plans outlined, we'll then match each and every city program across the city. Um, where do they fall in alignment with those goals? And then there will be a um, basically a scoring process that says this program is most impactful to meet these goals. And, and, and I think one thing that is really valuable in priority-based budgeting is it, it, it isn't done in a vacuum. There's an independent view of that, a separate committee um, that, that looks and says, do we agree with these scores or not, and how it impacts our citywide business plan. So um, this is going to take us time to evaluate. We've got to look at when we talk about the population served. Um, there is a lot of work ahead in this process. So we are planning with our fiscal year 2026 budget. That will be our first budget we're rolling out fully with priority-based budgeting, having the conversations of uh, programmatic views and, and, of course, the public engagement process of Kansas City's budget of um, really did we hit the mark here? Are we, are we meeting the needs of Kansas City's diverse citizenry? Thank you. Councilman Robinson, is that it? Yes, well done. Thank Krista. you. Okay, Thank you so now much. we'll introduce Councilman <laughs> Bunch you. and get to, the, get to the public testimony. Hi, Eric Bunch, 4th District, uh, joining in from my dining room table with, uh, with the family and, and uh, alongside me. So thanks, for, thanks, everyone, for being here today, and uh, thanks for joining in to, to weigh in on the budget. It was a very important issue and um, something that we want to make sure we get right. So thanks a lot. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So the way this will work today is um, we will give everyone two minutes to speak and ask your questions of us. And uh, this is not a question answer type of a dialogue. This is for you to come and speak and let us hear from you all. And then um, we will do just like Krista said, if there's information that needs to be shared back out with the public, then we will make sure we do that. So thank you all for your time today. Howard, I think we're going to start with the public testimony. If you'd like to start in person, online, however you'd like to start, please go for that. And we will do a two minute timer. I have Robin Ganahl, followed by Cecilia and Ezekiel. All right, good morning. Please state your name. Uh, good morning, Honorable Vice Chair and Council Members. My name is Robin Ganahl. I live in the fourth district and I serve as chair and a voice for kids on the city's Climate Protection Steering Committee. Last year, Kansas City set a strong example for the region by passing the 2022 Climate Protection Resiliency Plan and the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code. Now we need to implement those swiftly and equitably. The steering committee respectfully submits the following recommendations for this year's budget to enable the implementation of the plan and codes in line with meeting the city's climate targets in a way that ensures no one is left behind in the transition to a clean, sustainable future. First, please fund two additional full-time sustainability staff in the Office of Environmental Quality to allow OEQ to implement strategies in the climate plan and pursue and manage federal funding coming from the historic Inflation Reduction Act and ensure those funds are spent equitably. Two, fund five additional staff to implement and enforce the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code. This is important to lower utility bills for the life and building, life of the building or home and ensure inhabitants can better survive in extreme heat conditions, which could reach 120 degrees in just a decade or two. 
Third, increase funding for complete streets in Vision Zero to reduce emissions from cars. People must feel safe walking and biking. Therefore, we recommend fully funding public works requests for $9.8 million to accelerate the complete streets in Vision Zero implementation. Four, increase funding for natural systems. We're glad to see a million dollars allocated for trees, but unfortunately that falls well short of the five million per year recommended by the Urban Forestry Master Plan. And fifth, please fund bus service improvements. This is something we heard a lot from the community, was to continue to work with KCATA to improve that. The next two to five years are critical in the fight to address the climate crisis. Residents express strong support for Kansas City doing its part. We urge council to rethink the city's budget priorities to allow room in the budget for the changes we need to achieve our sustainability and equity goals. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll leave this letter. Cecilia, Ezekiel, followed by Joyce. Morning, my name is Ezekiel Amador and I live at 27th and Madison Avenue on the historic west side, which we all know is the best side. Thank you for making the budget public and bringing it to the neighborhoods. On behalf of the residents of the west side, we want to thank you for your support of the Tony Gary Community Center and the advisory committee. We ask you to maintain that support and partnership as we progress towards fulfillment. We leverage our community center as a crime prevention tool to prevent, to have kids engage with programming. They're not likely out to be causing mischief. They would just be too pooped out. Continued support items are to fully staff <coughs> with qualified quality employees and engaging youth and senior programming. As a reminder, two public housing locations, let's not forget them. Senior Center and Mobility dis Disabled. Let's not forget them. Consolidating three community center events does not help local neighborhoods and jeopardizes relationships. A logistical maintenance plan where center is rarely closed. Transportation to support our senior neighbors. Fully funding programs so people don't pay extra. The pool opened last month. The gym is scheduled for next week. Relationships with the community require continued nurturing. The other entities we consider partnership in the health of our neighborhood is the Kansas City, Missouri Public Library, the Irene Reese Branch, and the West Side Can Center. Our works, our improvements, our aspirations for our neighborhood are dependent upon these partnerships. We're here to preserve funding in these challenging economic times. We know your task has been daunting. Thank you for supporting the remarkable strides we've made in making the west side the best side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joyce, I think it's McGanther, followed by Ron Scott Meyer and Stanley Bryan Morgan. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joyce McGather, and I am here to speak on behalf of districts three and five, the neighborhood associations thereof, and the members who reside there. We came down last year and some of us spoke from the, on the issues that I am going to speak on today. In our meeting, early in our meetings, when we started meeting last year about this time, we identified three main issues that causes problems in our neighborhoods. Those main issues are crime, housing, and trash. We all know that combined that these three issues causes both social and economic problems. We asked in, uh, at this hearing last year that each registered neighborhood would receive funding in order to carry out small projects that would uh, help them to do what they could to combat these issues. In the meantime, these small projects would collaborate, we would collaborate with other organizations in the neighborhoods so that everybody could come together, most people anyway, could come together and work with the city on the larger projects that they have to combat these issues. We are trying to bring unity 
to our communities so that we are working collaboratively together in order to solve some of our problems. Kansas City has made lots of progress, but we do not see the effects of it in three and five. And we would like to see more effect of that in three and five. What we specifically asked for was funding for each registered neighborhood in order to carry out their small projects. Also, <clears throat> we, will we meet regularly, we'll continue to meet regularly. We will be calling upon some of you so that we can meet with you personally in order to solve these issues. We are going, we are going to make more progress the next year and the coming year and when we address you again next year that we will have made some progress because we have sought and we have gained your, your cooperation. Uh, also, what we will be looking at, of course, is that funding <clears throat> and we will be addressing the prospect project. And I think that's something everyone should address in our funding. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stanley. Okay. Good morning. And remember, it's two minutes, and we want to be respectful of each other's time so we can hear from each of you. Good morning. I'm Reverend Scott Myers. I'm pastor at Westport Presbyterian Church. I'm moderator of the Presbyterian Urban and Immigrant Ministry Network, and also president of the Westport Center for the Arts. I'm representing hashtag Good Trouble KC today, which is a group of people who are taking the path of dialogue to advance the cause of police reform. We've been sharing our principles with a growing number of leaders in Kansas City, held lengthy dialogues about these principles with police leaders, dialogue about our call for more black and brown people to be hired and promoted in the police department, especially black women. Dialogue, our call for policing leaders at every level, board members, labor, public spokespersons to become persistent, say it loud advocates for common sense gun reform. Dialogue about our call to begin a process to end white supremacy culture in the police department. We believe there should be more dialogue about this proposal for six million for a new jail design. Though renting jail space is not ideal, let's continue to rent while a deeper dialogue is held, which could include a deeper discussion of the subject of whether punishment and removal from the community at a high cost and expensive jail is the priority rather than these initiatives that combat systemic poverty, combat hunger, initiatives which combat drug abuse, creative initiatives which identify youth and young adults who are at risk of taking the path of committing crimes and intervening, and compassionate initiatives that repair family and community relationships before problems worsen, and bold initiatives that increase presence, not force, of community-friendly police in the community to increase security. Please vote no on this six million for the design so we can take the time that's needed under these post-pandemic destabilized conditions. Please vote no so we can take time required to keep learning the lessons of the gone but not forgotten year of 2020 when Thank George, you. my daddy changed the world, Floyd, Thank challenged you. us about our thinking on criminal justice right. policy. Thank you so much. Sorry. Please. Okay. Just one second. Are you the are you the next person on the list? Yes, I am. Okay. Stan Morgan. Great. Okay. Like I said, I'm Stan. It started a little early. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm Stan Morgan, and I am the community engagement advisor for Westport Presbyterian Church. I was just recently at the police commissioner board meeting. Um, I've been with the city for 20 years. I retired three years ago. I walked away from the city. They gave me this plaque. The second year I was there, it's a support award. Normally gave to large corporation. That year they gave it to an individual, okay? And I used to work for the uh, uh, Kansas City School District. Private schools, 20 years there too. 
So I do, I used to teach um, high school. At 21 years old, I'm in high school, Sale, Lincoln, Central. I do know about community. So it's very important that uh, community is what is needed. We don't need to have a show of force. We just need a show of presence. We need to bring programs back, uh, not necessarily music and sports. I'm talking about vocational programs, arts, dance. We don't need to militarize police. We don't need uh, a lot of things that are, are uh, they, they think that the community needs. They need programs. They, they need police. You can't have police uh, by showing uh, uh, crime as far as the violence. You deter crime by running programs, running successful programs throughout the city. Once you start running these programs, people will come to community. They're not going to break. The crime's going to keep going up. We're about communities. We're not about big business. We are not tourists. We are the community. We live here. Everybody else is visiting. OK? Once you understand that and realize that the community, what the community wants, that's who hired the mayor, not big business. The community is who elected the mayor, not big business. You can't run this stuff down our throat. The community, bring back program that will help. Thank you so much, sir. All right. Reginald Silvers. I'm sorry, just, we can't hear who's next. Reginald Silvers, Reginald. followed by Shabazz and Laura Mullins. Good morning, Reginald. Good morning. Good morning. Glory be to God for today, right? Uh, Reginald Silvers, many, many may know, child of God, president of uh, Local 500, uh, Union for City Workers. And so uh, looking at the, the budget, uh, I wanted to bring just awareness to uh, safety. Like, what are we doing with, with safety, right? We got safety officers throughout the city. And right now, I think we're leaving it up to the departments. Every department don't have safety officers. And so that's why the training is so lax and uh, not very well uh, issued, in a sense. Because uh, like water, we know how big water is. They got like three right now, they understand. And some other departments don't have them at all. And so when you don't have these people that's trained up, they get out here and they get injured. That's why we had a few weeks ago, we had a couple people lose some fingers. And so we need to get our training up to par. And so I would definitely like to see some safety program and the safety officers will tell you they self that they under, understate, understaffed, underpaid. And so I definitely want to see uh, some of that money situated to the safety program because if we prioritize uh, health and safety, we got to put our money where our mouth is, right? And so safety is definitely an issue. Uh, municipal courts, uh, we know we got employees over there that drive back and forth to jails and they understaff and they be driving by themselves with these, uh, I don't, what you want to call them? With, with people that's getting transported to jail, <laughs> put it that way. And so uh, they don't have tasers, they don't have certain safety equipment to protect themselves. And so we got to make sure that they, they got what they need to do the job. Because right now they are struggling. And a lot, of, a lot of times they left out because people don't even think about municipal court and the correctional officers over there. And so we definitely need to get that, you know, definitely addressed and also advertising uh, employment. Like we're not advertising employment. Like nobody even knows we hire. We got all these vacancies. So we have to get the message out to the community so that we can bring in more workers so we can address some of the issues that our citizens are having. Right. Thank you, so, Reginald. Appreciate it. All right. Next speaker. Shabazz. Followed by Laura Mullins. Okay. Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, well, uh, so, assalamu alaikum to all of y'all today. Good Me get morning. My, my stuff right. All right. I'm going to say a few words. Um, stop the six. Policy enforcers 
better known as contemptible receptionists of the bourgeoisie are not an appropriate choice for providing welfare for the emotional and mental development of the people. This is harassment. Um, this is the result of a failed state. This is the result of an emergence of a matilar uh, more materialized, uh, militarized uh, system here. Um, and the people should be worried, honestly. Um, I, won't, I won't say too much else because I'll, I'll start to get emotional. Um, but I will end with a, um, a quote by Asada Shakur. Um, it was in her autobiography. It goes like this. In tales told to children, in chants and cantatas, in poems and blue songs and saxophone screams, we carried it on. In classrooms, in churches, in courtrooms, in prisons, we carried it on. On soapboxes and picket lines, welfare lines, unemployment lines, our lives on the line, we carried it on. In sit-ins and pray-ins and march-ins and die-ins, we carried it on. On cold Missouri midnights, pitting shotguns against lynch mobs, on burning Brooklyn streets, pitting rocks against rifles, we carried it on. Against water hoses and bulldogs, against nightsticks and bullets, against tanks and tear gas, needles and nooses, bombs and birth control, we carried it on. In Selma and San Juan, Mozambique, Mississippi, in Brazil and in Boston, we carried it on. Through the lies and all, and all the sellouts, the mistakes and the madness, through pain and hunger and frustration, we carried it on. Carried on the tradition, carried a strong tradition, carried a proud tradition. Stop the six, all power to the people. On a significantly wider note, good morning, my name is Laura Mullins, I'm a third district resident and I'm an organizer with Decarcerate KC. I'm here today to urge you to remove the $6 million for jail design from the budget for three main reasons, policy, data, and conversation. I watched the municipal court budget presentation where most of the questions about this jail had the same answer. That's a policy decision for this council to make. The city manager said that a complicating factor for his office was that multiple decision points had not yet been reached. Everything I heard suggested that the $6 million for design is premature and therefore wasteful. We'd be paying $6 million for someone's not best work because we're not giving them enough information to do their best work. Which brings me to data. 27%, 27% was the probation completion rate revealed during the municipal court presentation. I want to remind you that we choose what to measure. Metrics of success are a policy choice. And when I hear that 27% number, I don't feel less safe. I wonder, what's going on with the other 73%? What were they initially cited for? What have they been up to since then, both positive and negative? There's a lot of data out there that we're not even looking at. It's entirely possible that a majority of those probation failures were people testing positive for marijuana. Do we really want to spend $200 million to jail people for peeing dirty? I don't. So <laughs> we can't even begin to consider what's the best way to move forward if we're not even looking at the data that we have available to right in front of us. Which brings me to the conversation. Last week, Councilman Robinson, my councilwoman, who I admire deeply, said that we need to have a broader conversation about safety in our community. I strongly agree with her on that. And we need to do, we need to look at the data, but we also need to look and talk to people. And it's not enough to just say crime is a problem. Who is being harmed? How is it being repaired? And what do we need to do to hold people accountable? These are the things we need to do before we spend a single penny on a jail. Thank you. Thank you. Elise, Elise Max, followed by Nathan Cole and Dylan Piles. Good morning. Hello, my name is Elise Max. I live in the first district and I'm very glad to be here today with you this morning. I know we're here on a Saturday because we care deeply about the safety and health of our communities. Um, I wanna to talk to you about the public safety portion of the budget um, and um, specifically removing funds that will prioritize incarceration over the well-being of our communities. I do believe we can live in a city without a jail. You're gonna hear from a lot of people about how we can reinvest those dollars for our community. 
We know about early childhood education. We know about after-school programming. These are life-affirming programs that are beneficial to the public safety of our community. But my hunch is y'all are gonna move forward with a new jail. And so I wanna point out that the $6 million going to the police department to design and create the jail is a huge mistake. First of all, their job is to fill that jail, right? So they have no expertise in rehabilitation, architecture, design, and public safety in that regard. Second of all, because we don't have local control of our police budget, that's like handing the money over to the state government and asking Governor Parsons to appoint people to get more involved in our carceral system. We do not want that in Kansas City. I think we've made that clear. My second point, I'm running out of, uh, before I run out of time, is the park expansion program for the park rangers. I couldn't find the exact amount on uh, the expansion, but I also haven't seen any data that violent crime in our park systems is on the rise. I'm really concerned about that because that program criminalizes people that live in poverty, criminalizes our unhoused communities, they can't afford bail, fills our jail, and I think those are the cycles of violence and harm that we need to be discussing when we talk about public safety in our communities. So in summary, I would like for you to stop the six million that goes to the police department for our jail design and defund the park ranger program in Kansas City. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Nate Cool. I live in the historic Northeast in the third district. I'm here today to urge the city to reconsider the $6 million allocation to KCPD for the design of a new jail. I think this proposal is disheartening on so many levels. To start, it should be obvious to us all that constructing new detention facilities with expanded capacities represents a step backwards for our community. A step backwards for everyone except KCPD who is being given full discretionary control of the project. More and more city residents, including myself, are waking up to the fact that KCPD is a state-controlled entity that we as city residents and voters have been almost completely disenfranchised from. Furthermore, it's troubling how little justification is provided for why the six million dollars are needed simply for the design of this new center that will then inevitably cost tens of millions of more dollars to construct. If this goes through, our county will at once have simultaneously two new jails being constructed. These projects, which command a significant amount of our collective regional wealth, will result in a larger population of our fellow residents in confinement. Like I said, I live in the Northeast and I can think of so many ways my district could benefit from increased investment, whether it's taking care of the hundreds of unhoused folks sleeping on the streets, Independence Avenue and Admiral especially, making parks more accessible and healthy, investing further in rent relief to buffer the effects of rapid living, cost of living in increases, improvements to deteriorating public housing apartments in my neighborhood, or even things like subsidizing the, rehab the rehabilitation of old neighborhood schools to, re to be repurposed as community centers. The list just could go on and on. I want to urge the city to retract this proposal and to try to understand that new jails are not going to address the underlying problems that engender strife and dislocation in our city. The, the city's objective should be to plan to reduce jail population through empowering communities to participate in our collective and shared life. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Good morning. Are you the next? I, I believe I was next. <laughs> um, my name is Dylan Piles. I'm a resident of KC in the second district and an organizer with Decarcerate KC. I'm obviously here today to oppose the six million currently budgeted to KCPD for the design of a new city jail and ask that it be cut from this year's budget. I'm gonna talk a little bit about like the boring policy side because we've been thinking about this a lot as a crew and as a community and we know that there is a way to eliminate this from the budget. Um, 
We also know, right, that the city believes it needs a new jail. We, we follow that. We, we see the meetings. We know that that's how y'all are thinking about this as a city. We also know that Jackson County is building a new detention facility that could already cost taxpayers over $300 million. This means that there's a chance that between the county and the city, we could be spending over half a billion dollars on jails over the next few years. Half a billion dollars of our money for the caging of human beings. That ain't right. As of now, the $6 million budgeted to design the jail is not connected to any policy or concrete plan. Normally, there would be an ordinance or a policy that would be connected to this money. That is not the case. It's completely suspended out in space, and the public has, for the most part, been left out of the conversation. It feels like playing a game with taxpayers' money, and it makes no sense to make this investment at this time when so much is up in the air about a possible collaboration with the county. We do have a desperate need in this city for rehabilitative services as well as mental health and addiction services, but I'm concerned that investing in a detention facility, even with an intention to make it rehabilitative, will only double down on the status quo of punishment and incarceration in our city. Our people don't need punishment. They've gotten plenty of that. They need resources. They need support. We also don't want the money uh, moved out of KCPD and still spent on incarceration. There's been so much confusion about this general revenue number, but you heard Krista Morrison say earlier, 797.7. 243.4 million of that goes to the police from the general fund. That's 30%. Do the calculations on your phone right now. There is room to remove that $6 million, and until the city is transparent about that number, we're going to fight for that money to be removed from the budget. Thank you. Joan Saltzman, followed by Avery Jones and Layla Zaidi. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joan Saltzman. I live in uh, 64131. And I am also here to speak against the $6 million for the new detention center. Um, it sounds like there are a lot of things that we don't know about the detention center, um, but there are things that we can extrapolate from what we know about detention. This center will disproportionately detain people who are unhoused. It will disproportionately detain people who are impoverished. It will disproportionately detain people who are mentally ill, people who are queer, trans, and gender nonconforming, people who are black and brown. What it will not do is make our community safer. It will not reduce crime. Jails remove crime from the public view. They do not decrease it. What will decrease crime is investing in our community. If we can spend $6 million to design a detention center, what could we do with $6 million for the unhoused, for the impoverished, for mental illness? What else could we do with that $6 million? I yield the rest of my time, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Avery from the 5th District, and I'm also here to speak against including $6 million for the design of a new jail. I've lived in and loved this city my whole life, but as time goes on, the decisions being made with this money are pointing towards the city not having love for me and people like me. This vision of a Kansas City that would choose to spend its money on a new jail, rather than funding the many systems and programs we've been pleading for, is not the Kansas City I believe in. As there's already another jail in the works, as was mentioned, building this jail would be plunging us deeper into a pattern that's not only ineffective, but poisonous. How many times are we going to repeat cycles that rely on racist and classist institutions that bring no life to, to the community, only separation and tragedy? We can't keep wishing for a better way if we're gonna keep choosing jails and prisons at vital choice points like this one. Yes, the situa situation is a little nuanced, and maybe some belief behind building the jail is purely logistical. The point still stands, that now is the moment to take steps past the status quo, to put our money in places that we truly believe in. There is always a better solution than building a new jail. And there are smart people in this room who could come to that solution and then go to bed knowing that they didn't contribute to the creation of another institution that will undoubtedly be associated with deep loss, trauma, and abuse for so many in this city. When there's unhoused people fighting for specific baseline requests to be made by the city, it's a bit dystopian to instead use our resources to house people in jails. 
Schools are closing and the bus system is embarrassing, yet we're thinking of putting our money into designing jails. It just doesn't make any sense. Investing in the many programs and organizations that really love on and serve the city, but don't have any money to do so is the place to start. That's the Kansas City I believe in. Hi, uh, my name is Layla Zaidi, and I'm a leader with Sunrise Movement Kansas City, a resident of, of the third district and a graduating social worker. I'm here to speak in opposition to the $6 million jail to giving KCPD any penny more than our state mandated minimum. And I have concerns and questions about the $11.5 million cut in public transit infrastructure upgrades. I am disappointed to see the Office of Environmental Quality once again not receive their full funding. We need a budget that reflects the community we deserve, our hopes for a livable future, and a government that cares for the people, not locks them up in cages and leaves them on the street. You can't talk about racism in Kansas City without talking about sprawl. And you can't talk about sprawl without talking about car dependency. And the impact of car dependency is asthma, disease, long COVID, and early death. And the people most affected by this are poor working class, black and Latina people with decades of difference of life expectancy. And this environmental racism stretches across the globe because 25% of Kansas City's emissions are from on-road transit, which affects the people back home for me in Pakistan. And true climate justice in the form of free, accessible public mass transit powered by good union jobs can address this. I simply ask this council, have you actually studied how microtransit will achieve our climate goals towards a unified, well-connected, mass rapid transit system? Did this council truly study the failures of bridge, which, which costed up to $1,000 per ride instead of $2 for a bus? And why is the only public engagement on this program with less than two weeks from launch a clearly photoshopped tweet with zero links or information? I want to know why can't we pay for the LED street lights with the money that we give to KCPD? I know exactly where you can find $11.5 million in our budget. And this council continues to contradict themselves when they demand local control on the campaign trail and then hand KCPD a blank check. Do not give KCPD more money, no money for a new jail, fully fund the Office of Environmental Quality, and hold KCATA accountable to giving us Thank a transit you. system we deserve. Thank you. Lorraine and Sorry, followed by Kashmir Ketterman, Ketterman and C. Gillis. We have Maureen. Is it Maureen? Are you here, Maureen? Okay. Good Kashmir morning. Kashmir and C. Gillis. All right. Good morning. Morning. Hi, my name is Mehreen Ansari. I'm a leader with Sunrise Movement Kansas City and a tenant in the third district. Today, I'm speaking in opposition of the 11.5 million diversion from public mass transit. I'm also speaking in opposition to giving KCPD another raise and $6 million for a new jail. Since I was 18, I have been relying on the bus system to get around. I'm 20, about to turn 23, so it's about five years. Um, I've had firsthand experiences of taking the bus to work in the morning, back in the evening, using the bus to get to a local gym and back, to get to doctor's appointments, to see friends, to get to school. I know firsthand the importance of our bus system being fully funded, just as many of my fellow bus riders do. I live in the historic Northeast, but work in Midtown, go to a gym in the River Market, love visiting my friends in the plaza, so it's safe to say that I have seen what parts of our city's bus system is funded and taken care of and what isn't. There is a stark difference between bus stops in the Northeast compared to other parts of KC. Bus stops in my neighborhood only have signs. No benches, no shelters, no trash cans. As someone with chronic pain, it's hard standing for a long time for late buses. But even if the bus stops in Midtown are better than Northeast, they can be improved since many don't have shelters and don't have benches. Our bus stops deserve to be dignified and not forgotten by the city. Don't divert 11.5 million from a system that needs more funding, not less. Don't fund cops or jails and fully fund our climate plan. I yield the rest of my time. Good morning. 
Hello and good morning. My name is Kashmir and I live in the 5th Council District of Kansas City, Missouri. I am here to call upon the Council to save our public mass transit funding as well as requesting that the Office of Environmental Quality is fully funded in order to reach our climate plan goals. Additionally, we do not need to spend $6 million on the design for a jail. We need our city to address the climate crisis and protect our residents. In 2020, in the thick of the pandemic, my mother put me on the street. As a young worker and student, I increasingly relied on public transportation to help me get around. Our city has become more and more reliant on personal vehicles, and not everyone has equitable access to one. We want more investment in our bus systems, not less. Why is the city manager proposing microtransit without talking to poor and working communities first? The council also promised to take the climate crisis seriously when they passed the updated climate protection and resiliency plan last year. Although that is great, that's a great step forward, the 2023 budget does not fully fund the Office of Environmental Quality. It is imperative that the OEQ is fully funded so that they have the budget needed to address the climate crisis in a productive and meaningful way. I am a young person who wants a livable and sustainable future right here in Kansas City. Temperatures are getting hotter and colder with more frequent extreme weather activity putting my community and I at risk. We need more funding for essential services like buses and taking immediate action on saving the climate, not more money on cops and jails. Why are we cutting $11.5 million of our sales tax dollars specifically for transit without our consent? Give that $11.5 million back to funding public mass transit. Kansas Cityans deserve a seat at the table when it comes to how our public transit infrastructure dollars will be spent. Thank you. Good morning. Hello, my name is Cassandra and I live in District 3 of Kansas City. I'm here today to speak against the $6 million being allotted for a new jail. I live in the Washington Wheatley neighborhood where we were recently told schools might close and where I was once able to take the bus to my job at the library. Recently bus lines are so infrequent I am not able to even count on them for groceries. Two of the main purported reasons for the new jail, mental health struggles and houselessness, are issues that as a public librarian I encounter daily. There is almost nothing I can offer those in need. There is also no transportation infrastructure to get people to the very few services we do have. I want this money to go towards actual programs for people to get the basic resources they need while getting to stay in their communities and be with those who love them. I don't want a new jail. I want schools and after school programs, bus service, access to medical services, therapy, and actual affordable housing. The $6 million could do so much to take actual care of people instead of continuing to lock many of the most vulnerable members of our community in cages with no resources or recourse. Fuck the police. Thank you. I have Chris, I can't pronounce your last name followed by Russell Gray and Raymond Forstetter. Forstetter. Sir Chris, Russell Gray, Russell. Raymond, Good morning. Hey y'all, my name is Chris. I think six million dollars shouldn't go towards a new jail. It doesn't make sense that you would put six million dollars into a new jail. Six million should go towards the community that is struggling like the working class and poor people. Example, it should go towards affordable housing, mental health, and et cetera. We are in recession right now. We can use that money to buy groceries and get gas instead of putting money into unnecessary things like the airport. That is unacceptable. You are already building a big county jail. That makes it more unacceptable. How are you closing down schools in Missouri but build a new airport? We keep throwing money at, at the police, hoping they are solve our problems, but it never happens. Six million dollars is research that could be used for the people. Thank you. Hello. My name is Russell Gray. I'm a resident of Midtown in the 4th District. I'm a member of KC Tenants and of Sunrise Movement KC. 
Um, first, I would like to say that I am strongly opposed to taking $11.5 million out of KCATA's ATA's budget, which should be going towards bus stop improvements and instead giving it uh, for the conversion of streetlights. In my work with both KC Tenants and Sunrise KC, we have done deep community engagement to hear what people's priorities are for KC. One thing comes up over and over again. People want more buses that run more frequently and better, stop, better bus stops where they can wait. Instead of listening to its citizens and prioritizing much needed bus stop improvements, the city is instead aiming to defund the bus agency. We have heard disturbing rumors that the city wants to instead focus on creating a microtransit service, something that I have never heard a single resident ask for, and something that has already been tried and failed in this city specifically in 2017. I fear that this transfer of funding will just put us onto the same destructive neoliberal path that has gutted so many crucial social services across the country in recent decades. Defund a public service so that it cannot pr provide adequate services, then point to its failures as an excuse to continue to cut its funding and repeat that process until everything has been privatized, making the rich richer, but leaving the people behind. That ain't right. KCATA does have its flaws, but the solution is not to defund the agency and abandon the city's bus riders in the process. I'm urging you to allocate the $11.5 million to the KCATA so that we can begin building up our transit system into one that can actually meet the needs of KC residents. And with my remaining time, I would like to speak in opposition to the city spending $6 million on the design of a new jail facility. I'm also opposed to giving the KC Police Department a single dollar above the minimum that has been unjustly mandated by the Missouri State Government. Decarceration is a climate justice issue. Racial justice is a climate justice issue. You cannot have one without the other. Overall, I urge the city council to listen to what its citizens have expressed as their priorities this last year. Less money for the police, more money for the bus system, and more effort to fight the climate crisis. Please listen to the people and do what's right. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, my name is Raymond Forstadter. I'm a fourth district resident, public transit user, and leader with Sunrise Movement KC. I'm speaking today in opposition to the proposed $11.5 million cut to KCATA's budget in order to fund LED streetlight conversions, as well as the bloated KCPD budget, including $6 million for a new jail. We should not be left with a false choice of either protecting funding for KCATA that could be put towards things like improved bus stops around the city that are in disrepair or non-existent, reopening closed routes and hiring more amalgamated transit union workers, and, energy, and necessary energy efficiency upgrades like the streetlights. One of the primary strategies of the Climate Protection and Resiliency Plan that this council passed last year is to, quote, shift trips to transit by building effective and efficient transit systems and mobility hubs. I find it hard to believe that removing $11.5 million from KCATA's budget does anything other than work against plans to build out robust, accessible mass transit systems that create good union jobs. Instead of divesting from a department that needs more funding and giving that money to another, why don't you look at the bloated KCPD budget instead? After all, streetlights are just as important to public safety as they are to transit. Rubber stamping budget increases for an overfunded, militarized, unaccountable police department continues to put us down a path in the wrong direction. $6 million for a jail looks to me like a council continuing to pump money into a system that shows you time and again that its main function is to criminalize poor folks and black and brown bodies. Every dollar allocated in this budget has an impact on the lives of people across this city. Playing political games to do things like virtue signal your support for KCPD takes critical investments from projects that can set, our, set the people of our city up to thrive now and in the future. Do not take $11.5 million from KCATA's budget. Do not put $6 million towards a new jail and fully fund the Office of, of, of Environmental Quality. Thank you. Lauren Sobchak, Alan Summers, followed by Karen, I can't pronounce it, you. Good morning, my name is Lauren Sobchak, I'm a resident of the 4th District. Um, I want to share with, with you some state statistics on incarceration really quickly because we don't have local control of our police. Um, according to the Prison Policy Institute, Missouri has an incarceration rate of 735 per 100,000 residents, people. That includes people in prisons, jails, immigrant prisons, I refuse to call them detainment centers, so please stick with me, they are prisons, and juvenile prisons, they're not justice centers, let's get that right. Meaning it locks up a higher percentage of people than any other democracy on the planet. That is disgusting and alarming that our state does this. And it reflects upon our city pretty heavily because we are a major metropolitan city. Each year, at least 128,000 different people are booked into local jails across the state. 
Um, and the turnover rate is alarmingly high in that regard. As a resident of Kansas City, I care deeply about our community and its children, and I trust that you do too. In my time working with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals, I've not met a single person who um, exists within our incarcerated community that did not experience some form of societal and structural abuse or neglect as children and into adulthood. Um, some of you might not know what structural abuse is. It's uh, inherently linked to inequality. And so I'll just define it for you really quickly. Structural abuse is the process by which an individual or group is dealt with unfairly by a social or cultural system or authority. The unfairness manifests itself as abuse in psychological, financial, physical, or spiritual forms. And then the victims of such abuse are completely incapable to protect themselves from this harm. The punitive and carceral system is one of the greatest examples of structural abuse found in our society. As council members, uh, you work within a system that empowers you to make decisions for our communities and our children, and I hope that you do not give $6 million to the design of new detention and jail, caging human beings. Good morning. Hello, and good morning. I'm Alan Summers, a member of Local 500. I'm also here to thank you all, one, for the contract that we did get. I appreciate the raises and stuff, but in light with all that, I noticed where the state has given cost of living raise to every state worker and is giving an 8.7%. I was kind of hoping that you all would look at that and see about doing a cost of living raise for the city workers. I mean, we're the ones here that have to do all the work, all the cleanup. We throw a parade, we like come out and take our own time. Sometimes we gotta take time out of our lives at home to do extra work to take care of stuff here. So I just would like people to look at that and maybe look into doing a cost of living raise for city workers around, you know, the city. I mean, the state's able to do it and is doing it. So I just kind of like to look at that. We like to feel appreciated too. And like I said, we do appreciate the raise that y'all did get us. So thank you thank for your you. time. Thank you very much. Morning. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Uhlenhut. I live in the 4th District, and um, I'm here uh, representing a couple of climate action groups, Citizens Climate Lobby and the Mothers Out Front. And, um, <clears throat> well, climate is just my, my foremost concern in the world these days, and um, I was very pleased that the City Council saw fit last year to acknowledge that by passing the Climate Protection Plan and the more stringent set of building uh, energy efficiency standards for new construction. I think those were great moves on your part. Um, and so now we need to carry out the vision. We need to put some flesh on the bones. And um, the, the budget does include some of that, which I was very happy to see. I'm very happy that we're converting our street lights to low energy using LEDs. I'm very happy to see $1 million being allocated for 10,000 trees. Um, <clears throat> but there are other things I'd like to see in there. Um, I think probably the most important addition would be more money for the Office of Environmental Quality. I heard uh, their, uh, their leader, Andy Savastino, the other day kind of indicate that there is lots and lots of money available to cities in the Inflation Reduction Act. And we apparently don't really have enough personnel to ask for the money. I mean, my gosh, I think that would be a travesty if we can't ask for the money. So let's get some money to make the requests. Um, secondly, I would uh, really like to see more money go to the planning department to enforce the new uh, energy efficiency code. I, I understand that they're kind of short staffed and I think they're gonna need more to make sure that this is actually put into place. Um, I also really think that more money for buses would be a wonderful, uh, another wonderful expenditure. I, I took the bus today. I've, I've been trying to take the bus lately, and you know sometimes I wait a really long time for a bus. Uh, now today worked really well, and I think that we need more frequent bus service. I love that the max is running every 20 instead of every 30 minutes. That makes a really big difference. I think we need more frequent buses all over town. Um, and uh, let's see, what else was I gonna say? I think that's pretty much what I wanted 
to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeremiah Rowland, followed by Catherine, I can't see your last name, and Unique Hewley. Jeremiah. Do we have Jeremiah? Nope. All right. Okay. We need so to the keep next going. Person, and we'll find Linda you. Brown. Linda. All right, good morning. Uh, Grand Rising. Um, <clears throat> I pre my name is Jeremiah Rowland. Um, you can call me Solo. I appreciate y'all for, you know, taking y'all time out today to be here, but I necessarily don't have to talk to y'all. I want to talk to everybody out here, necessarily. Um, honestly, these people, they don't care about us. If they can premeditate a jail, before it even is built, before it's even constructed, then their, their mind is not in the right space. If we're talking about west side is the best side, then don't forget about east side. You know, because east side is where everything is going on. East side is where I was raised. East side is where I'm from. And so please don't forget the other side of Kansas City as well. I know one side of Kansas City might be doing good, where it's like, oh, cookies and flowers and pixie dust. But on the other side, it's not that what's going on. It's friends dying. It's people dying. It's, it's, it's a lot of trouble and trauma going on. So I want to let y'all know to come together. Be, be together. Don't be a side. Don't be a part. You know, these people do not care about you. If you're talking about building a jail, open your minds. Think. Come on now. That's your kids. You feel me? That's your cousins, nieces, nephews, all of this. You feel me? That's going to be in them jails filling that up. So my name is Jeremiah, and I appreciate y'all. by Unique. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Linda Brown, live in the Blue Hills Neighborhood Association, president also. But what I'm here is to represent the third and the fifth district neighborhoods. One thing I think everybody fails to realize that neighborhoods are the backbones of which a city support and sustain as it reaches higher and higher. And we do not get a dime in our neighborhoods to do the work. If we did not have volunteers, if we did not write grants, if we did not ask for donations, we could not get the things done. But just stop and think, if we all stopped doing it, what would our neighborhoods and what would our community look like? And that's one of the things we got to put money into it. And one of the things, we should have a budget for each neighborhood, especially neighborhood associations that are registered and you know they are doing the work. And also the bus is important. They removed all the buses in our area. And we didn't even know they were being removed until senior citizens went to stand on the corner to catch a bus. So, so it just shows you need monies to make things happen. We know housing, crime, and trash is important. But until the city realizes money has to come in the neighborhoods, they have to give it to it. Because one of the things you have to say, you don't have to move out of the neighborhood to live in a better one. And then we all have a vital role to play in a partnership with the city so it, to reduce our brain drain from our neighborhoods and our cities. Go ahead. The bottom line is without neighborhoods, residents will uh, suffer. Uh, introduce yourself, please. You need to introduce yourself for the record. Kesey Milligan, Blue Hills Neighborhood Association. We'll start over there where you have your whole time. Good morning. Okay. I came to Blue Hills Neighborhood Association as an intern working um, from UMKC, um, and I am still there. It's three years later. And what I've seen over time is that these people put their blood, sweat, and tears. These are older adults. These are older adults 
who tirelessly spend all their time tossing and turning at nighttime to make sure that everybody in their neighborhood has a place to stay, that they are safe, they have food to eat, and a clean neighborhood. It is ridiculous that we have to beg you for anything. You go home to a neighborhood, your house is in a neighborhood. Does your neighborhood look like our neighborhood? All of these people out here have been suffering. It is trauma walking up and down the street, seeing trash, seeing individuals unhoused, seeing dilapidated homes along sidewalks. You can't even see the sidewalks. I would implore the city to take a better look at what you're doing with the taxpayer's money. We need money in the neighborhoods. If the neighborhood is registered, and especially if they are not a can neighborhood, they are not getting a dime to support their people. We're all a human race. We should act like it. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, y'all. State your name, please. Uh, unique. Hey, Brian, how are you doing today? You doing good? Yesterday, I prayed. I, I sat down and I was like, God, what does the end of capitalism look like? And then it brought me here. So I feel like I represent for the humanity and the heart of people. Since the beginning of my time, I can remember the ideal of prison being there. My mama tell me these stories about how she was scared she was going to get handcuffed to the bed because she would, they thought her baby was going to be born addicted to crack. You know what I'm saying? I remember being third grade and they saying that the map test was a way to show how many prisons they made. I'm a poet. They say you only write one poem in your life. From the beginning of my time, it's been prison, prison, prison. I've never been to prison. My brother been to prison. My mom been to prison. I seen the police come on my grandma on, on the porch with my grandma. She was handicapped. They took her from her wheelchair and took her to jail for no reason at all. So we giving $6 billion to an ideal of a prison. And they say, they say in my community that jail is a curse. Once your mom go, then you go. Then it's all down your uh, timeline. So if there is somebody in this room who can help fight that, then please hear me out. Please hear and, and feel me 100%. Because we not just statistics. We not just numbers. We people. And we going through stuff. And it was this study I heard earlier about cancer. And it's new. They said, they said that. They found out that if you can teach the cancer how to be a part of the whole, then the, the cancer can teach you how to beat the cancer, right? So what I'm trying to say is that the problem and the solution has to come from the, uh, a unified heart and mind. And uh, all of us have to come together. So please, whoever out there who can feel me, please feel me and reach out to me. I think we can change something. Thank you. Good morning. I heard the name Catherine. I think you met me. Let's see here. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes. Uh, good morning. My name is Kate Heinen. I'm a licensed master social worker uh, who's been working in the areas of violence prevention, safe housing, and community mental health for the last 16 years. I'm also a former city employee. I worked at the prosecutor's office as a victim advocate 10 years ago, which is crazy. Uh, the budget proposal states that reducing crime remains a key priority using violence prevention strategies on page 10. This proposed budget poorly reflects that statement. This allocation of funding towards policing and building a new jail is inappropriate and frankly delusional in terms of its suggestion to be about violence prevention. And I say that as a mental health professional. Policing is not violence prevention. Jailing and detention are not prevention, often the opposite. Incarceration further traumatizes the already traumatized, and then hurt people tend to hurt people. This is not a budget that reflects healing or accountability for the city's systemic atrocities. This is not a budget that reflects care for its citizens. It's a budget that promotes carceral trauma. 
If six million is allocated to design a jail and rehab center, I am cluing you in now that licensed social workers like me are who will be recruited to work there in that rehabilitation center. And to be honest, we don't want to work in a setting that has rounded up the people you've neglected with this budget by choosing to invest in policing and detention as a means of getting people into services. That is not effective. It's not an effective means to get someone into services. I'd rather work, I think we would rather work in actual violence prevention programs such as transportation, utility assistance, a lot of programs other folks have mentioned, housing first models that are not tiny homes, and many other programs which are not dutifully considered by this budget and would be much cheaper than a six million dollar jail design plan. The whole world will be here in 2026 for the World Cup. Let them witness the care we Thank have you. for our people, not incarceration. Your Thank, Thank you for you. your time. <laughs> Megan, Megan Freeman. Megan Freeman, followed by Louis Alanis and Brian Ripley. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Megan Freeman, and I'm a resident of the 6th District, and I am representing Marlboro Community Land Trust, which is in the 5th District. My comments today are about affordable housing. First, we'd like the Council and the budget to reflect an allocation of general revenue dollars to the City's Housing Trust Fund. We urge you to designate a portion of the future recreational marijuana tax and the short-term rental tax towards the Housing Trust Fund. Second, allocate resources to bring staff and improve the city's internal processes so that city contracts and payments for affordable housing projects and minor homes can be processed in a reasonable time frame. Many affordable housing developers and rehabs are waiting six months to a year and a half on contracts and payments. I myself am waiting nine months for one more permit to build four new houses in the Marlboro community. Third, please allocate dollars to fund a nexus study and prioritize its completion. Fourth, allocate dollars to minor home repair. As we talk about neighborhoods, as we talk about affordable housing, we have to include money to repair homes and make people livable, homes livable in a safe space. Additionally, I would urge the city to work with the existing community land trust instead of funding a community or citywide community land trust. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Good morning, my name is uh, Luis Alanis. I am a 18 year resident of the 4th District in uh, the historic Northeast neighborhood. Uh, and I'm here on behalf of the Ryugoku Soccer Academy. Um, I would like to address uh, the $6 million uh, budget that is trying to be added to the K Kansas City Police Department. Uh, but I, I would first like to ask a couple questions uh, because we spent a lot of time talking about the city's business plan prior to opening it up to the public. Um, how is the creation of a jail aligned with the city's business plan? And I would appreciate if the city uh, created a press release that explained to the public precisely how the jail contributes to the economical development of our city without disregarding certain lives in our community. Better yet, clarify how our business plan is prioritizing the well-being of all our community members. Uh, on a second, uh, second point, reevaluate the budget allotted for our police department and encourage the removal of a number of patrol officers from the 4th and 3rd district uh, and instead provide the budget for their salaries along with the $6 million as a donation to community programs designated to help community members become the best versions of themselves. Do not strip 
our public transit system of its rightful funding. This system alone is allowing people to find sustainability and provide for their loved ones. Uh, I'll use myself as an example. At 12 years of, of age, I was uh, playing for uh, Sporting Kansas City's Youth Academy. There was days when, as a matter of fact, my parents to this day do not drive. Uh, so I had to hitch rides with my teammates on days when nobody could provide a ride. You, I was seeing myself catching a bus from uh, Independence Avenue all the way to Swole Park on 63rd Street. Um, and then again, I had to live it when I got to attend Pembroke Hill uh, during high school. Uh, there was times when my car would be broke down and my only way to get over there was through the bus because unfortunately a lot of my classmates uh, reside in Mission Hills or the Brookside com uh, community. Um, lastly, if anything, instead of giving six million to the Kansas City Police Department, provide that provide that to our public transit system or any one of our community grassroots organizations Thank that's you. already working to help people professionalize themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, my name's Broden. I'm 23. I'm a tenant on Independence Avenue in the 3rd District, a blue-collar worker in South KC, and a leader with Sunrise Movement KC. And our cities, if our city's council cared about the everyday life of the average person, they'd be spending $6 million on repairing and improving our crumbling infrastructure that's stuck in the last century. Instead, they want to build another jail that will only hurt the community and the people in and around it. Our bus service in the city is unreliable and inconsistent, which hurts poor and working class people. Now the city wants to kill our bus system even more by taking 11.5 million of our taxpayer dollars out of the public mass transit fund, all while giving $11 million more to the KCPD. If the city cared about us regular people and listened to the people they represent, they know that cutting public transit budget and increasing the police budget will only lead to more poverty, more broken families, and more abuse, displacement, and murder by cops in black, brown, and poor working class communities. But they don't care about us. Who is making the decisions about our transit infrastructure? It feels like the people making decisions live in neighborhoods where the infrastructure is in great condition and they don't feel unsafe around a cop who can legally murder any of us. They supposedly, or they're supposed to represent us and do what's in our best interest, not the police foundation donors. We demand stopping any new funding to KCPD or the proposed new jail. We demand full funding of the KC climate plan and increased funding to expand, repair, and improve our city's bus system. Give us good jobs, clean air, and a livable future. Thank you. Gloria Boheem, Ken Hicks, and Ryan Solel. Hey everyone, I'm Marcelo San Juan, and I'm speaking on behalf of Gloria, who can't be here right now. Hi, I'm Gloria Byrne. I live in KC in the 4th District. Six million would stretch so far to uplift our fellow Kansas Cityans, most in the need of housing, enough healthy food, deservedly higher wages, better access to health care, including mental health, and how about some leisure time to relax, rejuvenate, create, and simply enjoy existing? Not done yet. Six million in design fees alone for a twin jail across from the new Jackson County Jail would be absurd to most people. But most people don't have a political ambition, uh, the political ambition of May Mayor Lucas or city manager Brian Platt who have moral compasses guided by whatever gives them more power without any guarantee of transparency to the good people of Kansas City and sometimes not even to their very own council members. The depraved injustice of looking up, uh, injustice of locking up so many folks in a cage who are nonviolent, often homeless, or can't afford to pay their bail fees, which is a whole different discussion, derails people from their dreams for themselves and their families. 70% of folks in the jail, um, just, a flu just a few blocks away, are black while only 26.5 of the city is black, 26.5%. That just ain't right. Are we really lacking the radical imagination to change this, or are we lacking the desire? If you actually care, 
We got the fix. Stop to six. Do we have Gloria or Ken? Gloria, I think he was reading for Gloria. And then I had Ryan. Ryan? Ryan's not okay. here. This concludes my listing for public testimony here in the chambers. All right, and now it looks like we have some people on the Zoom. Howard? Yes, Anna White. You have two minutes. Good morning. Sorry, uh, good morning. That was faster than I was ready for. Um, <laughs> my name is Anna White. I'm a, um, house, an affordable housing advocate in Kansas City and a member of the Promoting Equitable Neighborhood Coalition. And I'm here to uh, make some comments. So first, I would like, we would like to allocate general revenue dollars to the city's housing trust fund. We were very happy that the city residents passed the recent GO housing bond, but more dollars are needed and we must diversify the funding stream. We also urge you to designate a portion of the future recreational marijuana tax and short-term rental tax towards the housing trust fund. Second, we would like to allocate resources to bring on staff and improve the city's internal processes so that the city contracts and payments for affordable housing projects and minor home repair can be processed in a reasonable time frame. Like Megan Freeman of the Marble Community Land Trust mentioned, she's been waiting nine months. Our organization has been waiting over a year for funding. We are ready to go and uh, have received taxpayer support for our programs, but are stuck, unable to build the housing that we know our community needs. Third, allocate dollars to fund the Nexus study and prioritize its completion. In August 2021, City Council passed Ordinance 21. 0688 that directed the city manager to issue an RFP for a nexus study to evaluate linkage fees for the purposes of funding workforce and affordable housing. We request that this be adequately funded, staffed, and completed. This is the kind of information that our city needs to make well-informed decisions. Fourth, to allocate dollars to minor home repair. We applaud the effort to include money for home for home repair in this budget and request that this be given priority. The best thing that we can do is help people stay in their homes and live a quality life. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Monica uh, Fallon. Good morning, you have two minutes. Hi, my name is Monica Fallon um, and I live in Indian Mound, fourth district and I am a teacher who teaches students in the first, second, third and fourth districts and work with them there. Um, I specifically work with some of the most vulnerable students and at-risk students in the metro. For that reason, I'm asking council to prioritize our public mass transit funding. The program I work for is for many of our students, the last chance at interrupting the school to prison pipeline. We aim to get students a diploma and a job as we know this is the best way to keep people out of poverty or prison, um, thanks to educational economic opportunities. You may wonder how it could be hard right now to find a job with labor shortages and help wanted signs everywhere, but the number one barrier to my students finding good jobs is transportation. I've had students have to turn down good paying hospital jobs because exploitative fast food gigs are the only businesses that are within walking distance to them. Um, and about 20% of my students don't have actual cell service or mobile data to call for any type of ride share without Wi Fi access. Um, to not fund transportation that can change the life trajectory of children at risk of being a mass incarceration statistic or repeating cycles of poverty and substance abuse just to turn around and spend six million dollars on designing the same jail that we are essentially funneling our youth towards by not guaranteeing access to good jobs is as ignorant as it is cruel. Fully funded mass transit has the opportunity to propel this city into a new era with less unemployment, equitable access to good jobs, a viable environmental future, and less crime, violence, and incarceration. A purple micro transit van can't do that. Spending more money on police with a 48% homicide close rate won't do that. New light bulbs won't do that, and a pretty new jail won't do that either. You know what can help us make life altering change? More buses. Thank you. Thank you so much. Brian Dickey. All right, you have two minutes. Well, good morning. Can the council members hear me? We can hear you. Cool, thank you. 
Good morning. My name is Ryan. I live in the 4th District. I'm a leader with Sunrise Movement KC in the Midtown Tenants Union, and I come here today to ask this council to follow through on its commitments to the climate plan passed last year and to reaffirm its public commitment to the fight for local control over city's police department. Last August, this body acknowledged that environmental and human crisis is threatening KC. We passed the Climate Protection and Resiliency Plan with the aim of guaranteeing a city that meets our current and future needs, along with carbon neutrality. I'm dismayed then to see that this current budget does not fully fund the Office of Environmental Quality who will be driving the implementation of this plan. I'm also strongly against the proposal to pay for upgrading our streetlights to LED bulbs at the expense of transit at large. While upgrading these bulbs is necessary to reduce emissions, siphoning over $10 million from funding our bus drivers and bus stops is not the right move. Pulling funding from one climate solution that people rely on every day to another that is mostly just reducing emissions will only dampen public support for climate action, let alone find the face of the resolution we passed last year. Transit should keep its money, especially as COVID funding nears expiration, and funding should be allocated from elsewhere in the budget. I'd also like to see the line item of $6 million of the KCPD for the design of new jail to be stricken from this budget. I do not want to see a new jail built in KC, period. This would only encourage further punishment, incarceration, and incentivize filling cells to a department with no oversight from this council. If the city moves forward on building it regardless, please do not surrender funding and control of its operation to KCPD. To throw an additional $6 million into a police budget we have no control over is irresponsible, and to give KCPD full discretion over the jail's design, construction, operation from the start would be contradictory to this council's commitment to fighting for local control over our police. These funds and any plan to go to the police beyond the new minimum required by the state should go to public goods that meet people's needs, because that's where we see crime drop. Using this money to protect transit funding I mentioned earlier is a good place to spend it. And to close, I would like to thank this council for not only passing right to council for tenants facing eviction, but fully funding it in this budget. This program is something to be proud of, and I hope this council for be, can be proud for seeing it through. I hope you can see the rest of this budget through as well. Thank you. Thank you. Amaya Cook. Hey, Hi, good morning. You have two minutes. Great, thank you. Good morning, uh, my name is Amaya Cook and I'm a resident of the 5th District and an organizer with Decarcerate KC. Last week you heard about concerns with the proposal to build a new jail. Today I would like to expand on our concerns and present new information from our recent survey. As mentioned last week, Decarcerate KC conducted a survey with over 100 responses to gather feedback from the Kansas City community on where the 6 million designated for the jail should be distributed. Since then, we have received more responses, and the message is clear. People do not want a new jail. That said, we appreciate the city's efforts to implement violence prevention programs, but we want to emphasize that investing in these programs should not be used to justify the construction of a new jail. If anything, investing in violence prevention should cancel out the need for more incarceration. We are concerned that this proposal is not only out of step with public opinion, but also represents a lack of transparency and accountability. It is troubling that we have no control over the KCPD budget, yet we are expected to foot the bill for the design costs associated with the new jail. This raises questions about what input we actually have as a community when we're throwing away money into an institution we don't have any say so over. It's also concerning that the proposed new city jail would potentially be built directly across the street from another county jail that is already under construction. This is not only unnecessary, but costly. We know that this will cost in total approximately half a billion dollars, and these costs come down to a conflict between the city and the county. So whatever's going on between the city and the county needs to be solved because we as community members and constituents should not have to pay for those issues, literally. The community deserves more than this, and by more, I don't mean more jails. We are asking for more transparency, more input, and more consideration. We urge you to consider our concerns and rethink the proposal to build a new city jail. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Good, Good morning. You My name minutes. is Tony Van Treese. I'm a local attorney in Kansas City, born and raised in the third district. Um, I'm here uh, just to echo the sentiments of decarcerate KC um, and talk a little bit about the city adding to the police budget to the tune of six million for the design of a new jail. Uh, ultimately, this is going to cost the city and the county uh, over half a billion dollars. Uh, we already have projected costs, as we said, of over 256 million on a new Jackson County Detention Center already being built. Um, and this is not cost efficient. This is not cost effective, and the benefits to do not uh, outweigh the costs. Um, 
Kansas City Municipal Court study said that the city needs this facility to hold nonviolent offenders um, who are often held with violent offenders in the county jails. Well, a novel idea would be to focus on alternatives to incarceration for nonviolent offenders. Uh, like Mayor Lucas said, our very own mayor tweeted back in July of 2020, we don't need a new KCMO jail. Particularly, we have four county jails for violent offenders. Alternatives to incarceration are key for municipal ordinance violations. I agree with this statement wholeheartedly. And this money would be much better spent on comprehensive reforms to support and reduce recidivism, mental health treatment, and job readiness programs in marginalized communities. Instead of incentivizing more incarceration, because if they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on building the jails, they're definitely going to want to fill them up. Thank you. Thank you. More girls need a health solution. Good morning, you have two minutes. <clears throat> I don't see, oh, say that again. Marlboro. It's Diane Hirschberger. Okay. okay, please unmute and you have two minutes. We can't hear you, ma'am. Can't hear you. There you go. Well, we still can't hear you. <coughs> you might need to unmute. I can see you trying. How's that? Perfect. Good morning. You have two okay. minutes. Thank you. My name is Diane Hirschberger. I'm the executive director of the Marlboro Coalition in the 5th District and a 26-year resident of Marlboro and a lot longer in Kansas City. Um, specifically, I want to first mention um, the coalition's support um, and appreciation for having a uh, an equity look back at some projects that were. I think we've lost it. Or specifically Marlboro. One is uh, fifth district PIAC funding for lighting in our parks, which is a big safety issue. Second is geo bond funding for some <clears throat> safety uh, in infrastructure on along Paseo. Uh, we support the community center uh, increased funding for staffing. Um, the Marlboro Community Center was the focal point of our organization, one of the focal points for being founded, and it has been understaffed for the past 12 years. Um, we also in, um, support increased bulky item funding pickup, um, park rangers, which is a major issue in our neighborhood, um, and minor home. Um, supporting the no firsthand on the ground what needs to be done. Uh, that also supports what Blue Hill says about um, neighborhoods receiving funding for um, the hours and hours and hours and hours of volunteer work that are done. The last thing I would like to mention is a budget item for $5 million for Rebuild KC. Um, I do not know the specifics of what that is intended for, but we would encourage that that funding be uh, much more limited and focused than anybody who wants a park bench or anybody who effectiveness goes farther. And I would advocate that that effectiveness would be based on um, neighborhood-based projects that are submitted. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Holly Harris. Hi, um, my name is Holly Harris. I live in Walnut Grove in the um, fifth district in Marlboro Community Coalition. And I would like to um, express my support for um, PIAC funding for some parks that are in the area, Rich Rado Plaza, Arletta Park, and Marlboro Terrace. I would like to um, express um, support for GO bond funding for traffic calming. Um, increasing funding for community action network centers um, and also um, community center staffing across the city and um, park ranger staffing. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilwoman, that's it. 
All right, very good. Have there been any other new comment cards from the um, people in the, in the audience? I believe it's, is it Caro? I mispronounced his name, Higgs. Oh, okay, well welcome, good morning. You have two minutes, sir. Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I grew up here in Kansas City. All my family stays up and down what I believe is 5th District, which would be Prospect on the east side. Um, I'm here with decarcerate, decarcerate KC, but in actuality, what inspired me to speak to you all is over time, I've seen how there's this dynamic of our people losing positive things in the neighborhood. Somebody said West Side is the best side. That's right. When we go out and we go out to eat, we go to the west side. We don't spend any money on our side. So how is y'all throwing all these millions of dollars to us to fix our problem? How is it going to help us when that money is going to go right back to the west side? <clears throat> to businesses that spoiled with nepotism, people like Dylan Platt here who's had his head down the whole damn meeting. I don't know if that's his job to have his head down. But I went to ACE, an um, African-centered school, where I learned the history of people coming up here for generations, telling you all our problems, give us the tools to fix our own problems. Why can't we own the prison? Y'all building it with our money. Why can't we have the profit? A gentle smile, somebody staring over there. Why is it so awkward when we want to own the prison? If y'all enslaving our people, why can't we have the slaves, have them out cleaning up trash? I went up to Lee Summit, everything's clean. What surprised me the most was a program they have called Transitional Housing where you can stay there and you can stack your money over three months, they won't charge you anything. Why do we have a two year long section eight waiting list? This is our tax money. Why can't we build things for us to make things and sell things to our own people? Nobody wants to parlay with us. The Middle Easterns at the gas station, they don't like making eye contact with us. They don't like seeing us every day. All these races, these races, these people y'all have in our neighborhoods, y'all give loans to set up businesses. They don't even like to look and talk at us. They look down like Dylan the whole time. And they give us a gentle smile, but they walk by. When I'm on the west side, when I'm on the plaza, we walk by, you guys don't make eye contact with us. People who are dressed like y'all, who got their hair done nice like y'all, we're invisible to them. Yet we provide everything. Yet we bleed and we sweat for everything. My father, along with a host of other family members work for the KCATA. They sacrifice time from their families. They come home and complain to their families over years. Y'all changed nothing. Thank you. Thank you for your oh. testimony. Olivia English. Okay, I can't tell, but it, Marilyn may have said this. Is there somebody online as well? Olivia Marilyn? English. That's yes, hi. Yes. Sorry, I was on mute. Can you see me? Here yes. you have two minutes, please. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Olivia English and I live in the third district. I am an entrepreneur and I've dedicated my life to many things around innovation. Um, I would just say that my objective in speaking today is to ask city council members and community, community members to embrace a mindset. A mindset that is more patient, supportive and forgiving to those in our city that are innovating in the ventures of humanity's bare necessities like food and air and transportation and energy. Government is notoriously slow and we will not meet the demands of the future without innovation. Penicillin, the light bulb, the printing press and cell phones, these things are born from innovation and creators. Innovation and failure are tied together. So I would just say, um, yeah, we need to embrace innovation. We need to embrace trying new things and you know, it's not just building a new stadium downtown, but it's also how are our community gardens doing? How are our local neighborhoods doing? And in conclusion, I'll say I've been totally inspired by everyone today. And yes, let's defund the $6 million to the prison. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee and council. Can you hear me okay, Madam Chair? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning. Thank you for being on. Thank you. Thank you for your time. My name is uh, William Davies. I'm a resident of uh, the six districts uh, in the Brookside Waldo uh, area. I uh, live with my wife, um, uh, my fur babies, and soon to be uh, first time expecting a father. Um, trying to keep things brief, we'll first echo the support that you've all received for fully funding the tenants' right to counsel. Also, uh, applauding the, the wisdom and good testimony of my friends and neighbors, encouraging you to exercise caution and uh, to encouraging you to not. Um, move forward uh, with adding additional funding to the police department and 
uh, for putting more money towards the carceral system when uh, the city has continued to commit uh, and do, do great work uh, to put funding towards programs that are truly meant uh, and will help people thrive, helping to ensure that our air, our water is clean, people are able to get to work, to get to their homes, to be more connected, uh, and we're putting uh, the health and well-being of our residents and our children uh, uh, first. Um, and just in my capacity, I also serve as a community organizer. I work for the Sierra Club, uh, Missouri chapter, working in uh, northeast uh, Kansas and northwest uh, Missouri. Just want to you know, flag that one of the great things that was passed in the Climate Protection Resiliency Plan last year, as well as in a number of policies led by members of this committee, uh, was the focus on transparency, leveraging the wisdom and expertise of our residents and uh, community neighborhood associations to make sure that we're having people-driven policy. Um, it's concerning to see that there are, as was in the case last year, last year's budget, there are some things in this budget where essentially there has been no robust public uh, engagement. Um, and this is really the first time where folks are hearing about it. We need to continue to lean into making ample opportunities for those impacted by policies we create um, to have a voice uh, in shaping them. You know, for example, last year, um, a, a, an entire office was proposed to be removed uh, and moved to a different department uh, during the budget process. This is not a time for new uh, kind of radical policies to be suggested. We need to make sure that we're hearing uh, uh, from, pe from people in our city. We're ready to go to bat for you. We are doing it now. Uh, let us continue to do that and have an open dialogue before we make big decisions uh, like this. Thank you very much for your time. All right. That, that's it, Councilwoman. That's it? All right. And do we have any more speakers here in the chambers? All right. I see a hand, but no card. So if you'll come and acknowledge yourself and tell us your name, we will give you two minutes. Good morning. I would like to say I have never spoken at anything like this before. What's and your I name, didn't please? Plan, uh, Molly McAuliffe. I live in the 6th District. Good morning. Um, it is honestly ridiculous to me and disgusting and insulting that this city would continue to move forward with funding a police department that is currently under investigation for abusing the people in our city. And the people here clearly do not support a new prison. And it has been proven time and time and again that prisons do not help anyone. They put people in a system, and then the people that get put into the system can never escape. It is a never-ending cycle. And also, um, we need to be putting this money towards things that are actually important, like affordable housing and buses. It takes me 10 minutes to get to work by car, I checked this morning, it would be faster for me to walk to work than it would be for me to take public transportation. It would take me an hour and a half to get to work at 8 a.m. Monday morning. And that's ridiculous. We need to stop funding things that the community has no need for. It has been proven that these things do not work and there's no reason to be continuing to throw money that we have worked hard for. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. I think that's all of our public testimony. We're good? Okay, no public testimony online, no more in the chambers. Uh, first of all, I'll thank everyone who came out this morning uh, for the public testimony. I appreciate all of our residents giving us time, um, your wisdom, uh, the things you care about are very important to us because yes, we work for you. And so we're so grateful that you all came out and gave us time, whether it was online or in person this morning. I'll thank our staff that took their Saturday to be with us. Thank you very much for all your extra time to be here on a Saturday morning uh, to our budget office for all of the work they have done to get us to today and, and to this process. My colleagues, thank you all for being here. Thank you to our uh, sign language interpreters. That was really an important component. We appreciate you taking time to do that so that everybody can be involved in the process. So next steps, just a little housekeeping. We will be in this room Tuesday, March 7, from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. for the final budget hearing. It will be in this room and virtual. So just the same exact format as today, we will have a presentation from Krista Morrison from our budget office. They'll give us an overview, just like they did this morning, and then we will open it up for public testimony, both virtually and in person. Same will apply. Uh, we will have free parking at Wolf Garage at 11th and Oak. Bring your validation slip here and grab 
grab it um, when you come in and you'll be able to use that for free parking when you leave. So we want to thank you all again and have a very safe and blessed day. Thank you. We're adjourned. Spinning.